First Baptist Church. How's everybody doing? You guys want to stand? We're going to worship this morning. We're going to sing the Father's house. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. It looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. Fail you want to find me when my father does. Fail you want to find me, cause that's what my father does.
good morning, First Baptist. We're excited you're here this morning. As we continue in worship, I want to read from Psalm 34, a psalm that's been on my heart this week. Verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear in him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Let's continue in worship and stand together as we sing about the blood of Jesus.
doors one more time. <laughs> Thank you for this morning. Just thank you for a wonderful time of worship. God, uh, just thank you for bringing everybody here. And God, what an amazing gift it is to be able to come here and worship you freely. God, uh, just what what love you have for us. God, we don't deserve it at all, one bit. God, we just thank you for your son, Jesus, and for him dying on the cross. We don't deserve that at all. We don't deserve anything in this world that you've given us. God, we're so thankful for your forgiveness. God, just be with us uh, the rest of the sermon. You can be seated this morning. You guys thought I was going to come out and do a solo, didn't you? I'm just kidding. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. Good morning. We're glad you're here. If you're a guest, thank you for being here this morning. We know there are plenty of places that you can choose to come worship. We're glad you're with us this morning. I want to go ahead and dismiss our children for Children's Church, kindergarten through fourth grade. If you're a guest and have a child, kindergarten through fourth grade, if you'll just head out this door right here with Mr. Terry. As we'll go over there and have children's worship, they're running out, always fun to see. Right, we have had some a busy summer as a church, as many of you know, we've had multiple mission trips and just uh, many things going on at the campus and facilities, and Wes is going to talk a little bit about that, uh, but one thing, a couple things as far as announcements that I did want to make you aware of is on Wednesday, August 3rd, uh, if you are a youth or coming into youth, so sixth grade coming into seventh grade, about to start the school year, or you just graduated. We're having a back to school bash on August 3rd at 101 Arbor Crest Drive. That's Brandon and Jessica Henson's. So we're going to have a back to school party. It's going to be like, and uh, we're going to have pool, ping pong, all kinds of fun stuff, basketball. It's going to be a great time with good food. So if you are a youth and want to come join us for that, that's this Wednesday, August 3rd. And then from there, we will be meeting at the Graves County Public Library. We have access to their community room. So we're actually going to be meeting there for the rest of August. So I just wanted to make that announcement to make sure you guys were aware of that. And then we are also going to have our Founders Day on August 21st. So please mark that on your calendar, August 21st. That's going to be a big time where we celebrate uh, just as a church and really just celebrate the Lord and his faithfulness. I mean, this has been an interesting past nine months and just seeing what the Lord has done through that has been just incredible. So that is a time we will come together and uh, celebrate uh, as a church and worship the Lord. Uh, as far as giving, we have some drop boxes here right outside of the doors. There's two little black boxes there or you can text to give. That's the easiest way. Text FBC Mayfield to 73256 or you can give by mail. That's 100 WKT Technology Drive, Building 1100, and that's in Mayfield as well. As many of you know, Wes is back on from vacation. Praise the Lord for that. It's been really, really good for him to be back. I know he needed some uh, much-needed time away and some rest and relaxation and ready to get back at it. We have a lot of things coming up that we are planning as a church, so anticipate that. Uh, Awana will be starting up as well pretty soon, so get ready for that. That will be a lot of fun. We'll be at the Blue Building again, so next week expect an announcement where we have a date for that. But let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll pray for Wes as he comes to deliver uh, from God's Word. Father, we love you. God, we are so grateful uh, to just come together as a body of believers and sing praises to your name. God, I'm reminded of Psalm 34. Just taste and see that you are good, God, that just in the midst of our suffering and despite our circumstances that we can look for you for comfort, for refuge, because you are good. God, we so are so humbled at this just opportunity to even come before you. You are the creator of the universe. You are the uh, sustainer of life, Lord, and that you desire a relationship with us is just 
just completely overwhelming, God. So I pray that we take these moments where we open up your word that you've revealed to us and we take that time to really learn and hear what you are saying and how we can apply this and worship you through this. I pray for Wes as he uh, delivers your message this morning, Lord, and I pray for the church that we would continue to be faithful and continue to serve you and glorify you in what we do. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Ethan. I've got that exact same shirt, man. <laughs> good morning. It is good to be back with you, especially from the beach. So, <laughs> You know, you get there at the beach. We were at Orange Beach, Alabama, and uh, you get there, you get to the condo that you've, uh, you've paid a pretty hefty price for for the week. And you walk in, and guess what? From day one, from the first second of walking, guess what's already on the tile floor? Sand. Sand. I'm like, we just got here. Did you not clean the room? And so, what? I mean, with the condo did not even have a broom, so mom went and bought a broom. And then I spend my time, you know, mom can, I am, I am sweeping up the floor, and I'm finding as I get the, the, the dust pan, I'm, I'm sweeping, and I'm like, I'm going to there's sand all over the place. Well, then I start walking around on the tile floor. And guess what is still on the floor? Sand. It's everywhere. It's hot. It's sticky. And there's sand everywhere. It was good to go and spend some time with family. But praise God for coming back from vacation. But really, praise God for Blake for filling in the past two weeks and preaching on, on Ruth. I know he did an excellent job. So thank you, Blake, for for that and thank you for allowing us to have a little bit of time time away. It really was good family time and just good relaxation time. Turn with me this morning to Exodus chapter 1, please. Exodus chapter 1. If you're unfamiliar with where Exodus is, it's right after Genesis. If you're unfamiliar with where Genesis is, Ed, we'd love to have you more often here at church with us. Uh, first book of the Bible would be Genesis. The second book would be Exodus. And for the next several weeks, I would like for us to begin a small journey through Exodus. We may not cover all 40 chapters in detail. We'll probably look at parts of every chapter. But we may not cover all 40 chapters in detail because that would take a long time. But I do want us to journey through Exodus and I want us to see God's power, and I want us to see his provision and his protection and his glory through a very unique time. In fact, the word that kept coming to my mind as I was thinking about Exodus is that God's chosen people were displaced all the time through Exodus, displaced. They were not where they wanted to be. They didn't have a church building. They didn't have a place to call home. They, it wasn't convenient. They weren't comfortable. It was, they were displaced almost the whole time through the book of Exodus. And we're going to see some neat things there. That They had to just follow God, and they had to trust God. When it wasn't easy, they had to keep following him. When it wasn't convenient, they had to just trust him. We're going to see sometimes that they rebelled sinfully against God as they were going through displacement. But the whole time, God was with his people. We need to hear this. The whole time, God was with his people, and God was faithful, and God had a plan. I'd like us just to begin in a good place in Exodus, which is where? Chapter 1, verse what? Verse 1 is a good place. Yeah, We're going to go 1 through... It's on the screen. Yeah, a bunch of cheaters. So... <laughs> Exodus chapter chapter one. Look, look there with me. There, there's something here that is you know, it sticks out to me. It's on my mind, and I want us to uh, to consider it. <clears throat> so Exodus chapter one verse one. These are the names of the sons of of Israel or Jacob who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household: Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad. And Asher, great names, right? All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. 
And Joseph was already in Egypt. And then Joseph died. And all of his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. And they, they multiplied and they grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now somebody's thinking, how in the world can you come up with a sermon out of those seven verses? Trust me. There's plenty to say in these seven verses. But the part that I want you to kind of look at with me, if you've got your Bible open there to Exodus chapter 1, the verse that kind of makes me just smile, you know, as a, a pastor theologian, hopefully, the, the, the verse that gets me is where it says, Joseph was already in Egypt. It's verse 5. I want you to look there. I want you to I mean, just look at it. You know, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher, verse 4, verse 5, all the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. I want you to know this. That's like the understatement of the year, okay? It is the understatement, not of the year, of the decades, that Joseph was already in, in Egypt. I came up with a few things that were kind of close, maybe, but not really. It's kind of like saying that Einstein enjoyed science. We laugh at that one because we, we kind of get that. Well, I mean, he was a brilliant scientist. Or it's kind of like saying Steve Jobs worked for Apple. Well, there's quite a bit more to that story if you know Steve Jobs. Or Bill Gates likes computers. I mean, there's, there's more to that. There's this whole foundation that you got to know. It's kind of like saying Billy Graham was a preacher. Is there more to that? Yes or no? Yeah, there's, there's quite a bit more to that. It's, it's almost like saying Mother Teresa was a nice lady. Is there more to that story? There's quite a bit more to that story. Or it's kind of like saying Christian Leitner played basketball. <laughs> yeah. How many of you remember? Oh, put your hand down, Harrison. I see that. Harrison's going, yeah. No, you can get out. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. How many of you remember where you were when Leitner hit that shot? Oh, man. We're going to win. We're going to win. We're going to win. We just lost. Anybody remember that? Joseph was already in Egypt. My goodness. You got you to gotta get this this morning. That's, that's just, I mean, just a little small, tiny sentence with a huge meaning. And so what I'd like for us to do this morning quickly is I want us to just kind of dig in right there. And I want us to think about who Joseph was. The big deal as we start our journey in Exodus. You really can't grasp Exodus, until you think about who Joseph was. And so number, number one that you're going to see on, on the screen is this. He was, he was beloved. In fact, he was the beloved son of who? I got all day. Okay. Joseph was the beloved son of Jacob, the firstborn of Rachel. Oh, you got to get this in your, in your mind. You don't have to turn there. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be reading several verses this morning, and I want you just to think about them, and let's ponder these. Let's take this in and see where it's guiding us. Genesis 37, verse 3, says this, Now Israel, Jacob, loved Joseph more than any other of his sons, because he was the son of his old age, and he, he made him a robe of many colors. How many remember this story? I mean, you know this story well. This is some of our Sunday school stories from years past. That, that Jacob loved Joseph. Riley will ask me all the time, Daddy, am I your favorite? <laughs> well, she not ask me this all the time. Almost every day. She'll ask me today at some point, Daddy, I, I know I'm your favorite. Am, am I your favorite? And I would look at her. Like sometimes I'll get down on my knees and I'll hold her right here and I'll look at her. And I'll say, Briley, you are my favorite daughter. <laughs> you know, and there for just a moment, there for just, she's like, oh, here it is. I knew it. I knew it. And then I'll say, daughter. And she's like, I know that. 
and I'm your, I'm your only daughter. If you remember this story, though, Jacob, let me go back a little bit. Stay with me. If you remember this whole story, Jacob loved Rachel. And he served her father, Laban, for seven years for her hand in marriage. You remember this story? And then some of the most beautiful words in all of Scripture are right there with this story. It says, so Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love that he had for her. Oh, Tara and I have been married for over 18 years. I'm sure she would say the same of our <laughs> marriage. It seems like just a few days to her because of how awesome it's been for 18 years. But for a long time, Rachel couldn't have kids. Jacob's other wife, Leah, could. Remember this story? A lot of tension between, by the way, everybody that reads this story. If, you've not, if you're not familiar with the story, you know, he worked seven years for Rachel, and then it says, almost like, behold, he woke up after the wedding, and it was Leah. And every guy's like, how do you not know that was Leah? You know, anyway, weird story. Read the text. You'll be like, that is a crazy, crazy story. And then did he work even longer? Another seven years to marry Rachel, a beautiful story of how much he wanted to be with Rachel, but she was barren. Leah was not. You need to just read the story. I mean, Genesis is just full of these awesome narratives. The Lord finally blessed Rachel with a child, and it was Joseph, the firstborn from the one Jacob loved Dearly. So Joseph was special from day one. In many ways, Joseph was like set apart. And Jacob loved Joseph more than his other sons. And they knew it, by the way. You can read the text. So number one this morning is beloved. Well, number two this morning, you got to know this about Joseph. If we're going to talk about Exodus, you got to know about Joseph. Number two... He was rejected. Joseph was rejected by those who should have loved him. Who was he rejected by? His own brothers. You know this story. I won't go into all the details. But after hearing about Joseph's dreams, his brothers hated him. It's in Genesis 37, if you haven't read the story lately. Even his father at one point, by the way, Jacob was like, hey, you got to be quiet. Rebuked him for talking about his dreams. And then you know the story probably. After some time passed, Joseph went to check on his brothers as they were pasturing in the fly, or they were pasturing the flocks. They were out in the fields. And as he approached his brothers, they saw him in the distance. And what did they do? Conspired to what? Kill him. Their brother. Let's kill our brother. The one they should have accepted and loved. The one they should have shown grace to. They wanted to kill him. Thankfully, I believe it was Reuben and Judah who stepped up and said, no, let's not do that. So instead of killing him, listen to this carefully, they stripped him of his robe and they threw him down in the pit and they sold him to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. You can see all these details in Genesis 37. Let's pause. Is it fair to say at this very moment that Joseph was a little bit displaced? Yes or no? Was he comfortable? Were his circumstances convenient at this point? Was this an easy time to follow and trust God, did he feel safe and secure? Yes or no? He's just been sold to the Ishmaelites by his own family. But let me ask you this. Is this right where God wanted him? Yes or no? In fact, is it right where God needed him for something that he had set up in the future that Joseph didn't know anything about yet? He was rejected. Had to feel terrible. We can read about it on the piece of paper here. It had to feel 
terrible. Number three, you know this story probably pretty well. He was, he was tempted. Remember Potiphar's wife? He was tempted by Potiphar's wife. So after being sold to the Ishmaelites, Joseph was then sold again to the household of Potiphar. We want to talk about displacement. Number one, you're sold into slavery by your brothers. And you're like, well, this stinks. Well, then the Ishmaelites take you towards Egypt. And then you're sold again into the household of Potiphar. How many times can you be sold in a week or two? Incredibly displaced at this point. But if you read this story, it's kind of cool because it begins to talk about how the Lord was blessing everything that Joseph did and everything that he touched. Everything went well if Joseph had something to do with it. He was a sold slave, yet the Lord was using him and blessing everything that he did. In fact, Potiphar put him in charge of basically everything. And you probably know this story that Potiphar's wife wanted to be with Joseph, and she tried to seduce him on multiple occasions, but he continually refused her advances. And so what did she finally do? Anybody? I heard the right answer. She falsely accused him. You know, basically one time she cornered him, a unique position to be in, and, and tried to get him to sleep with her, and he wouldn't do it, and he ran off, and she actually had part of his clothing in her, in her hand. Well, then she accused him of trying to be with her. Remember this story? If you don't, you can read about it in Genesis 39. And obviously, when Potiphar heard this story that his wife had made up, this false accusation, he was very upset and put Joseph where? In prison, displaced yet again. I want you to think about this. Number one, he was displaced when his brother sold him into slavery to the Ishmaelites and then displaced when the Ishmaelites sold him into Potiphar's house. And by the way, he, he earned a great reputation here in Potiphar's home. He was put in charge over a long period of time over everything that Potiphar wanted him to manage. And then all of a sudden, he finds himself in prison. It's almost like the moment things get comfortable, the, the moment things get convenient, he's displaced yet again. But let me ask you, is that where the Lord wanted him in those moments? Is that, was that part of the Lord's plan for Joseph's life? Yes or no? He was displaced. Was God confused in those moments? Of course not. He had this perfect, perfect plan for Joseph's life that Joseph could not fully see in that moment, right? I it's not even in my notes. I mean, is, is there anybody in here that your life has just gone just crooked sometimes? It hasn't gone the way you thought it was going to go? Things didn't turn out the way that you had hoped? I mean, just, just did not seem right, yes or no? I want you just to kind of zoom out for a second and know that God still has a plan, right? You've got to know this. Because this is a messy story. Maybe you feel like your life is kind of messy sometimes. I mean, this is a messy, messy story, yet God puts it all together for this amazing deliverance later on. Number, number four. Do I have three on the screen so far? Yeah. Beloved, rejected, tempted. Well, number four is exalted. Exalted. Joseph ends up being exalted by the Pharaoh. You probably know this story. You've been to Sunday school over the years. While Joseph was in prison, he was there with two people. Who were they? Cupbearer and the, and the baker. So you got the cupbearer. That's the person who's supposed to test the meal before the Pharaoh eats the meal to make sure it's not poisoned, right? Like if the cupbearer dies, don't eat the meal. That's kind of how, that's a terrible job to have. Right? I mean, you know, make sure the food is not poisoned. So you've got the cupbearer in prison with Joseph, and you've got the baker. I just want you to think about it. That's an interesting combination. You've got the one who's supposed to test the food in jail, and then you've got the one who's supposed to bake the food in jail. There must have been a bad meal somewhere, right? Something didn't go right. And you've got the cup baker, I mean the, the cup bearer and the baker in prison with Joseph, and they both have dreams, and Joseph interprets both dreams. 
He does the cupbearers first, by the way, and the cupbearer gets restored. Joseph says, you know, your dream means that one day, one day soon, that, that Pharaoh is going to restore you. You'll be put back to your position. Well, now the baker's going, huh, well, that was a good outcome. What does, what does my dream mean, and what did his mean? You're going to die. Yeah, so just because the first one turned out good doesn't mean that yours will. And by the way, both interpretations came true. And when Joseph was talking to the cupbearer, by the way, you need to read this story. He's like, listen, I'll tell you what your dream means, okay? I'll tell you what your dream means. But when you get out of here, make sure you what? Remember me, dude. Like, I've been in here for a long time, a couple years now, and you need to remember me. Make sure you, I'm innocent. I shouldn't even be here, but I've been here for a couple of years. And make sure you remember me. The cupbearer gets out, just like Joseph said, and forgets him. He's like, my bad. Yeah, it's your band. A couple years later, the Pharaoh started having these, these dreams. Number one dude starts having these dreams, and they need to be interpreted. Two years later, the cupbearer is like, oh, <laughs> oops. Actually, I remember somebody that interpreted the dream that I was actually going to live and not die. I mean, how do you forget that person? You know, I... There is somebody in prison that you've had there for a long time that can actually interpret your dream, Pharaoh. By the way, you want to talk about being dis displaced. This is a long-term displacement. You get this? So, I mean, I know we want God to answer stuff like tomorrow. And when God doesn't answer us tomorrow, we're like, there's no God. This took years to bring about. But God wasn't confused any of this time. Long story short... Joseph interprets the Pharaoh's dreams. There's going to be seven years of plenty. There's going to be seven years of famine. Therefore, Egypt has to prepare right now for the famine. Then Joseph's like, hey, you need someone in charge of all this. This is a nationwide project. You need someone gifted with administration to take this thing on and put this whole thing together. You need to find somebody that can do that. And Pharaoh says, huh. You know, you always got to be careful when you're suggesting stuff like that, right? Pharaoh's like, I know just the guy. Joseph, I want you to do it. He's like, oh, don't know that I was thinking of me, but sure. And Pharaoh puts Joseph in charge over all the land of Egypt. He says, you will be number one except for me. I mean, puts him, exalts him. There's no one as powerful as Joseph except for the Pharaoh. Back in Genesis chapter 41, the Pharaoh says, You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards to the throne will I be greater than you. So Joseph was exalted and known throughout all the land. Such a neat story. That's why it makes me laugh where I read in Exodus chapter 1 that Joseph was already in Egypt. Yeah, I mean, and Leitner played basketball, right? I mean, there's so much more than just saying that that you have to know. In fact, Exodus assumes that the reader knows all about Joseph. Well, number five. By the way, you might wonder how many we have. We've got 13 this morning. I'm just kidding. We've got, we've got six, five and six. Somebody was having a heart attack right there. Number five is Savior. Uh, Joseph saved the Egyptian people from starvation. His interpretation, his plan. Genesis 41 says this. Listen carefully. When, when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph. What he says to you, do. Genesis 41, 55. It sounds so easy to, to read. But for seven years, Joseph prepared for what others thought would never happen. Because he, he had said in this interpretation, there's going to be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. Well, don't you know that when he's like, listen, during the seven years of plenty, we've got to store up. We've got to get ready. In fact, he said, I'm taking a fifth of all the produce that you grow. Imagine the farmers. You're taking how much? 
I'm taking the fifth of everything, and we're going to store it up in big grains. Don't you know, like on year two, people were like, this is a dumb idea. Ain't no famine coming. Look at everything. Everything's growing great. Don't you know on year four, they were like, this is crazy. You're wasting all of our stuff in these bins. Can you hear the ridicule? Yes or no? I guarantee it. Can you hear the complaints? Yes or no? Can you imagine the social media post? But then it happened. The famine arrived, and the people were starving. People were dying. And we haven't had a famine in the United States, and I don't know. Are there famines around the globe right now? Yes or no? We've got a picture of a community suffering from a, from a famine. I think we can, we can put it up. I mean, these are, these are kids that have done absolutely nothing wrong, of course. They live in, in a region. This is in Somalia. They live in a... By the way, this is a very tame picture. I could show you other pictures that I don't show them because then the picture would dominate, and I don't know that the story would, and the storyline today needs to dominate of what's happening here. But the reality of a famine is, is this, is people don't eat, and our human bodies are so frail. A matter of days and weeks without food and without water, and this is what happens. And then what is the end result of a famine? What happens to people? They die. There's death. And it's terrible. So we read just so easily here in the text that a famine In fact, it was called a severe famine. But if we don't pause for a moment and consider what that really means, we miss it. Because famines bring death. Staggering amounts of death. And because of Pharaoh's dreams and dreams that God allowed Joseph to interpret, and because of Joseph's plan, people lived. Joseph's plan would have been considered at this point nothing short of a miracle, a plan from God himself, a plan to save people from certain death. Hear that carefully. A plan to save people from certain, certain death. And Joseph would have been viewed as a savior. Last thing for this morning, sort of. Every time a preacher says last thing, take that, very very skeptical, okay? Number six would be forgiver. If you know the end of this story, Joseph ended up forgiving those who were not worthy of what? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Maybe the most powerful story in this whole Joseph story is that he extends grace to his brothers, the very ones who sold him into slavery. Jacob tells the brothers, hey, we're starving. There's a famine. We're starving. Go get some food. I hear there's this guy in Egypt who, for some reason, stored up all this food and is now giving out the food to those who are perishing. Go to him. The brothers go and they they come to Joseph and they don't recognize their own brother, Genesis 42. I read an article one time. It's so neat because early on in the story, as Joseph is coming to them, as they're watching the flocks, he's a long ways off still and they recognize him and say, look who's coming. Later on in the story, after they've sinned against him and rebelled against him and wanted to kill him and then sold him and forgotten him. Abandon him. He's right in front of them. And they don't recognize him. Woo. At this point in the story, Joseph's initial dreams were coming true. That he was going to reign over his brothers. Over his father, too. 
Now, we don't have time to go through all the different twists and turns and different things that Joseph puts in place to test his brothers. I would beg you to read the story. You just shake your head as you're going through it going, my goodness, what a saga. But finally, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. And here's what Joseph says in this moment. You know, as he's revealing himself to his brothers and his brothers are like, oh my goodness. Joseph says that God sent me before you to preserve life. He's not blaming them. He continues later on, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And the brothers are like, no, we're the ones who sold you. No, we're the ones who threw you in the pit and stripped you. And No, we, we did that. And jo Joseph is insistent, no, God did this. He continues on. He tells his brothers this, that you shall dwell in the land of Goshen. It's good land. You shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. And there I will provide for you. They've got to be looking at him like, you're nuts. And speaking to his brothers, finally, he says these words in the very last chapter of Genesis. As for you, you meant evil against me. What's the next phrase? But God meant it for what? Can God take something tragic and turn it into something good? Yes or no? But God meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I'll provide for you and your little ones. And thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Next time you don't want to forgive somebody, next time somebody cuts you off in a parking lot, next time somebody, I mean, whatever, next time somebody, ask yourself, did, did they sell you into slavery? Did they throw you in a pit, strip you of your clothes? Did they, did you, did, is that what happened? Was it worse than that? The answer is probably not. He comforted them and spoke kindly. He, he forgives the very people who sinned against him, who planned to kill him, who stripped him and sold him and abandoned him, forgot about him. All right. I always think there's three parts in a sermon. There's the time where you like take off in the plane. There's the time that you fly the plane. There's the time that you land the plane. Let's go land the plane. <clears throat> Let's go back to Exodus 1.5 real quick, and I want you to just Ponder this with me for a moment. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Well, I mean, again, and Leitner just played basketball. But there's so much more to that phrase that you have to grasp before you continue in Exodus. And that's what we've talked about this morning. Final question. Is there even more in this story? Yes or no? Is there even more? Beloved, rejected, tempted, exalted, Savior, forgiver. Does that fit anybody else that you know? I know someone else who was a beloved son. John 3.16. I know somebody else who was despised and rejected and we esteemed him not. Isaiah 53. I know somebody else who was stripped and sold. Who was tempted and found faithful. Who was exalted and given this name above every other name. That at his name, every knee should bow. I know someone else who provides for our most desperate need. I know someone else who saves us from certain death and gives us life, even eternal life. I know someone else who forgives those who are undeserving. Do you know him? I know someone else who is a savior, not just from physical death, but from eternal death. You see, I know who Joseph 
truly points us towards. Do you? Yes or no? Let's pray. Father, as we begin this this journey in Exodus, remind us that it's okay to be displaced. Remind us that as a church right now, First Baptist Mayfield, we're right where you want us. We're right where you can use us. It may not be comfortable, certainly not always convenient, but you have a plan, a perfect plan, a beautiful plan that we can't fully see the end of just, just, just yet. But you're going to use us for your glory. And remind us of what this story really points us towards is that we have a Savior, and His name is Jesus. And He is the one who forgives those who are unworthy. He is the one who forgives those who have rebelled. He is the one who is exalted, the name above every single name. The stone that was rejected has become the capstone, cornerstone. Remind us this morning of what we have in Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen.